All right, so if you'll open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if I were to ask you what the number, what the number three represents in the Bible, a lot of you will know that it's in reference to the Trinity. Whenever God references things in threes, it makes you suspect, it makes you wonder if it has any connection to the Trinity. So I will be covering three things which are very, very powerful things that helps us in the Christian walk. If we major in these three things, then you can see your life being transformative. Now in our advanced discipleship classes, I covered a lot of devotional topics in a heavy sense, a very introspective sense. We're going to do it with these three areas, and hopefully they'll be helpful to you. Uh, they are faith, hope, and charity. Faith, hope, charity. Now, we've covered charity, and that's been kind of eye-opening on how we should live our lives and how to deal with very confusing issues regarding this topic. Now, with faith, hope, charity, we're going to expand these three on how it can be applied to our everyday living. If it has any bearing to the Trinity, now this is just a wild theory, and that's, this is the only wild theory I'm going to give over here in the devotional topic. If it has anything to do with Trinity or with the Lord, I could be wrong, and if I'm wrong, and like I said, I'm wrong, but the reason why I want to bring it up is because I'm hoping if there's Bible believers out there who can find, if I open up Pandora's box or if I give an open door, I'm hoping somebody else will build upon that and discover more things. And if they discover more errors on my side, then that's fine as long as we're getting somewhere. Yeah. If uh, I'm opening the door to a, a truth out there that we may not have known about or a knowledge out there we may not have known about. So I'm hoping that I can do that for the people. What I think, which is possible, I think that faith could be spirit because we walk by faith, not by sight. The Bible says walk in the spirit. So our spiritual life and throughout our entire dispensation, it's by faith, correct? That's how God operates. That's how we live by. So I can see it that way. Charity, it might be body. And the reason why is because Everybody nowadays, they want to go by feelings. But these feelings have to be controlled to be used effectively for the Lord. You have to think about this. The Lord could have created your body without emotions. But he put emotions there, those sensations in your flesh for a reason. Because it makes up who you are and God wants that response from you. The body tends to love the things that it wants. But God wants you to see if you can use those bodily functions and love for him instead, which is why he takes much value out of love. And perhaps, if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, now abide faith, hope, charity, these things, but the greatest of these is charity. Why charity may be greater than faith, even though this is spirit versus body, is because there's more sacrificial acts of the body out of this. So that could be it, but like I said, I could be wrong, and it could sound controversial. That's why I said I'm open to be corrected. Hope, it could be reference to the soul. And the reason why is because it has the deep uh, mental, uh, and it has the, uh, even the emotional aspect in there, the feeling aspect. Compared to love or love in action charity, that's more of outward functions that bodily functions have. It wants to desire love. But soul is something that doesn't require physical objects. They talk about within classical music under Tchaikovsky, it wasn't fleshly, nor was it spiritual, it's more soul. Their uh, art is also where they mention about it's in relation to the soul. So there's some emotional aspect there that doesn't really have to do with physical. So hope fits that pretty well because compared to charity, it's less of a physical, tangible thing. 
It's more of an emotional plane there. But anyway, that's just uh, my guess, and I could be wrong. If it has any relation, then we see that Jesus did the ultimate act of charity or love by dying on the cross. That's the part of the Trinity. And then if this has to do with the Holy Spirit, that's the reason why when we get saved by faith, we receive the Spirit at the same time. And then if this has to do with soul, hope by the Father, we can see that it talks about the Father of hope, God of all hope. That's quite mentioned often in the Scripture. And the blessed hope that has to do with a perfected state when we go to heaven. We have a hope, and that's not of this world. See, not of the physical plane. That's out there where God is. So anyway, um, the hope is also ordained and planned by the Father, where he used the Son to commit uh, the act of sacrifice. Anyway, just guesswork on my part, if there's any relation. But the point is, if it has important elements where it relates to the Trinity or to body, soul, and spirit, then think about how we should live our lives because we compose a body, soul, and spirit. Because our worship of God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Understanding that, then faith, hope, charity, if it has any bearing to those aspects, then it might be more important for our everyday living. Let's connect faith, hope, charity as follows, and then we can understand some more things. I'll have to write faith, hope, charity again. That way we can see the connections. Hmm. Let's go here first with faith. You're also going to see some interchanging at times with faith, and then hope and charity. When we live by faith, we don't go by sight, and that's found in 2 Corinthians 5. Will you turn over there? How important is faith? Even though it's less important than charity, it doesn't make it less important, if you understand what I mean. What I mean is that faith is extremely important. It's the victory. It's your everyday living. And if it's that important, then how much more important is charity, right? So that's what you're going to get out of these teachings. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, your whole walk is based on faith. The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. If we realize our Christian walk is based on faith, then we have to understand we don't have to go by feelings when we read our Bible or when we pray. A lot of times we feel like that we don't love the Lord when we serve Him or come to church. But remember, those are feelings, flesh. See that? Faith is something where in spite of feelings, you contradict it. You have to just believe that what God says is true. Now, I know what it's like when you come to church, when you fellowship, we all say it, that we get refreshed but our flesh don't feel like it. So it's an act of faith on your part that you have to believe that when you came to church today and when you go back home, even if you feel like you got nothing, that you really did get something. Amen, that's good. So that's an act of faith on your part. And you'll, to be honest, when you look back in your years, you're going to realize that, wow, if I didn't go to church, I would have been in worse shape. So whether your flesh feels it or not, you are getting sustained. And you're getting sustenance in the spirit. That's the reason why when you go out soul winning, when you sing hymns, when you read the Bible, pray, come to church, remember these are all acts of faith. So if your feelings go contrary, well, go contrary to your feelings. Who cares? Why do you care about your feelings sinking in with your faith? Faith should always be contradictory to feelings anyway. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's a feeling-based sensation. These are all connected to your flesh. God wants the flesh to be fully crucified. Hebrews 11, we see victories out of faith. Again, it goes contrary to sight. Whenever we see things in our perspective, where everything in life is falling apart, 
It doesn't make sense. Remember, faith is an act where it doesn't go by what we see. So remember that. You have to always remember that. If all things work together for good, but nothing works together for good from how you see things, and you question God, how does this work for good? God, I don't see that. Lord, there's something wrong going on over here. Well, that's called faith. Welcome to the land of faith, so don't blow it. Don't mess it up. This is now your chance to prove your faith. Or are you going to wait for some feeling to come, some positive feeling, and then you have faith? That ain't really faith then. But why is it that every time you have to feel something, then you have faith in the Lord? Then you're not going by faith, you're going by feeling. Faith is during those acts where you don't feel anything, or when you feel contrary, yet you just believe and you cling on to God. When you look at Hebrews 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, we see there are things that go contrary to how you see, but you believe it anyway. Now, you notice that hope is in the picture as well, and we're going to expound that a little more. But whatever practice you do in your life, you're going to see it parallel or overlap with hope or other elements like charity. We walk by faith, not by sight. So against how you see things. What does hope play into the picture of that? Hope plays into the picture that when you believe that whatever you're seeing is not working out, but it will still work out, then hope comes into the element where there's a positive... Now get this, it's, if it's connected to soul, there's your positive emotion. When your flesh feels contrary, the sensations, the feeling of the flesh get contrary, at the same time you have another feeling there, right? That feeling is from the soul where it's giving that sensation of positivity that I do have a reward up in heaven, that God will supply all my needs, that all things work together for good. So hence now you see the feeling of the soul fighting against the feeling of the flesh. Because of your soul yielding in to the spirit by faith. But anyway... Uh, I could be wrong about that, but nevertheless, this fact is true. There's a feeling there that contradicts with your fleshly feeling. So there's a feeling there that contradicts your fleshly feeling of despair, negativity, and discouragement, and then sin and grogginess, slothfulness, etc. When you have hope, and hope can come because of faith. When you put that act of faith then when you put faith into every word that the verse promises you, hope builds up. And then you think about heavenly things in Jesus Christ and his promises. Now within this act of hope, hope can build up. Hope can increase through the acts of faith. If we go to Romans 5, go to Romans 5. Notice the steps within faith. The Bible says in verse 3, Romans chapter 5, and then verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. If we... Go back here at Hebrews 11. Go back to Hebrews 11 and keep your hand at Romans 5. Go back to Hebrews 11 and then keep your hand at Romans 5. You'll notice that from these acts of faith, it required a lot of testing, tribulation, trial, and patience. If we look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 36, verse 36. 
And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. So Noah's tribulations, right? As Romans 5 mentioned, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, Receive not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Verse 1 of Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith we see overlaps with faith and hope, but let's go by Romans 5 with the process here. Why do you rejoice in tribulation, Paul says? Because tribulation, it works where you can have uh, patience. Actually, let's do this. This is tribulation that every believer has to face eventually. When tribulation happens, it's a test for our faith. Well, I believe. Well, how do you know you believe? You have to prove it. How do you know you believe? You have to prove it. You believe because you feel it? Uh, unfortunately, that's what Christianity does, right? Christianity only stands as long as there's a positive preaching. Ain't that eye-opening? As long as there's worldliness and things that make your flesh feel good with contemporary music, etc. You notice that's how Christianity grows and thrives? But it's actually apostasy. That's a fall. No wonder many people become atheists because all they see is a goody two-shoe. Uh, they see just a very nice, benevolent God, and then all of a sudden bad things happen to them. Faith is tested during tribulation. That's how you prove your Christianity. That's how you prove that you're a Christian. That's how you can see if you really believe in God or not. When tribulation occurs, then here's your patience. A lot of people who don't stay faithful in church, it's because they're not patient. See, that's very eye-opening. Those who do keep coming to church because of something that makes their flesh feel good, they're very impatient. They need that... Um, Consumer desire satisfied constantly every time they come to church, right? You have to see if you're patient, and then when you go through patience, you put up with it. When you put up with it, faith is always undergoing, right? You're always trusting in the Lord that, hey, I know that I'm putting up with it. I know it's a lot of pain, but I believe the Lord will pull me through, and what he says will work for good. So then once that happens, then experience occurs. You get to experience, then you know, ah, so I've been through this road before, and I know how to handle it, and I've seen God move, and I believe my faith has been exercised enough to this point so I can overcome this problem. Then experience turns to hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. With hope, remember, it's that, wow, I know that something good's going to come out of it. Uh, I've seen the Lord minister to my life, and then there you get your feelings, so to speak. Your emotion, your positivity. But see, positivity and emotion don't come without the negativity, without the testing. You just expect some outside source to just make you feel good. But this is something you have to develop yourself. If you never develop anything yourself, then you're always going to be dependent on some outside source to feed you. So you have to develop that positivity, that promise, that blessing, that attitude of uh, thanking the Lord. That can only come through the end after you undergo it. But the irony, when you look at 
Romans chapter 5, it mentioned He mentioned in verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. So there's an attitude of rejoicing, being happy about the faith being tested. So what you would think the positive emotion is at the end, it's actually at the beginning. You might say, why do I have to do it at the beginning? The reason why is you have to have it at the beginning because you know you're going to get that good thing at the end, that the Lord's going to work it for good. That God has something wonderful planned out of your life through the tragedy, through the pain. Amen, brother. And even if you don't see it down here, you see it up there, right? Amen. Once you get up there, imagine that in spite of all the negativity you went through and you went by faith, not by sight, you didn't see a single good thing. When you get up there, the Lord shows it all to you and then you're just totally satisfied that you don't have words to say and you thank God. Amen. See, you glory in tribulation. You thank God that, Lord, I'm so glad you didn't take that away or you didn't deviate or change your plan. Uh, you did it this way. You had me undergo it. Otherwise, I would not have gotten this. I wouldn't have gotten this result for you. That's the reason why you should glory at the beginning, even though you don't see the glory now, because this is, again, faith. You don't see the end result or the actual glory at the end. You go by acts of faith about that glory in the end that you're going to get. That's why there's glory, positivity at the beginning. If uh, people always live life that way, then they can be happy all the time, right? Then they can glory all the time. When you undergo tribulation, you have to walk by faith and then notice there's that glory that comes out of it, right? That hope that comes out of it, right? When you walk in the spirit, the soul can react to it. But you know what people want to do? They want the body to function first so that their soul can react to that. But you know what happens when every time you just satisfy the body? Eventually the soul becomes immune to it. Eventually you're not happy anymore. It just goes through an endless pit and desire of you're searching for something more out there. So what happened is your spirit has not been, exer uh, your soul has not been exercised by the spirit. That's the thing. Once, you're, uh, once you walk in the Spirit, the Spirit is growing. And when it's growing, your soul is growing at the same time. It's feeding into it. The real you, remember, which is the soul, is a part of not your fleshly nature, but your spiritual nature. A lot of your maturity, your mentality, the way you view things in life has changed, right? Ever since couple of years you got saved afterwards because of your walk in the spirit so it changed who you are I mean let's be honest some of you if you went back to your lost friends and the lost friends see you now they they would tell you you're you're a different person now why do they say that because you the person is the soul that kept reacting to the spirit the spirit, when you walk in it, has to be based off of faith. If you always walk by faith, believing God's word, acting upon God's word, then it feeds the real you. So think about it. If the body is suffering pancreatic cancer and every feeling is contradictory, if you've been constantly walking in the spirit, the real you, the person, is still the one that makes the difference. It's always happy no matter how your flesh feels. Did that make any sense? Yeah. There's a, a, there's a stressor, there's a huge significance with walking in the Spirit. And when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, they went through torture, affliction, but everything was by faith. They had to, in chapter 12, verse 1, they had to lay aside any weight. They had to run with patience. They had to lay aside the sin. They had to keep looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith. 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. As you live by faith, you always have to look at Jesus, not at others. When you look at things in this world or at other Christians, you're always going to see yourself as living an unfair life. People have it better than you, or the world has much better opportunities over there. You see, you're walking by sight, then, not by faith. You have to blind those things and then walk by faith. And when you close your eyes and walk by faith, what do you got to look at? You have to look at Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So when you look at Jesus Christ, see what he went through. See how much he loved you enough to die for you. And when you compare your suffering with him, you always realize that you'll never compare to him. If you never compare to him, then you get on yourself that, come on, you got to endure. You can be patient. If my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, went through much worse than I can, than I ever did, then I can at least go through this much for him. Yeah, that's good, brother. When you always compare yourself to Jesus Christ, and you'll keep striving, and you'll keep going, you'll keep going. Now, I thought that we want to be more like Jesus Christ, or we want to catch up to Jesus Christ where he's at. Well, now's your best chance, right? What can be better than following after Jesus Christ, becoming more like Jesus Christ than suffering? What can be better than that, more than crucifixion? Ever thought about that? Uh, crucifying the lust of your flesh is where you, become, you can become more like Jesus Christ than ever. After all, you're trying to put to death yourself and let Jesus Christ in you become more manifest out of your life that you want to yield into. Um, think about this. If you're going through that conflict... As you try to strive to become more like Jesus Christ, there's a conflict there. Where is that conflict coming from? Where is it coming from? The only thing is your flesh. That's the only thing. I mean, your flesh doesn't like the suffering. Or your flesh loves the temptation. Or your flesh questions why. It's always the flesh that contradicts. Only the flesh is putting the barrier. It's not the environment. It's not the problem. It's not the world. It's not sin. It's not the devil. It's your flesh. Flesh is the only thing that can put that barrier between you and Jesus Christ. The devil only attacks you. The world tempts you and offers things to you. But you make the final decision. And it's up to you what you're going to do with your flesh. So the flesh is the only thing that will conflict it. So as you walk by faith, what happens? Conflicting, contradictory things come up in your thought and in your heart. When that happens, there's that moment where do I crucify it or do I yield into it? And when you yield into it, you yield it to the flesh. But if you crucified it, you crucified it based off of faith in Jesus Christ. Faith that, hey, I want to be this, I don't want to be this. I want to be this, I don't want to be this. So once the conflict comes, there's your proof right there, your proving moment. Am I going to go become more like this guy, or I'm going to become more like him, Jesus Christ? There's your moment. Like I told you, crucifixion is probably the best thing or you can become more like Jesus Christ. Good, and it's time to prove it. When those conflicting desires and lusts and thoughts and feelings come out. You're not really a good Christian like you would think after thinking about this. Right. If you always have conf uh, conflicting feelings, conflicting things happening to you quite often, it shows you still have so much flesh in there that has not been crucified yet. The Bible says that 1 John uh, chapter 5, we know that faith is the victory. 
We are overcomers by faith. Any complex scenario or trial you can think of, the key answer for you to have victory is faith. So you always have to interrogate yourself, not like uh, interrogating yourself where you go, what did I do wrong or stuff like that. Interrogating yourself in, do I believe what God says is true? You have to interrogate yourself, do I believe God's promise is true? A lot of times when you go through complex scenarios in life, I know that the problem is undoubtedly you, but a lot of times you have to ask yourself, am I just letting it go and trusting God? A lot of times you don't do that. A lot of times you feel like you have to solve the problem, right? You have to figure things out. But then you're not walking by faith and you're trusting in your flesh and you have to let those things go and trust the Lord. Now, of course, you want to examine yourself and make sure that you're living right for the Lord. So what can happen is that conflict, see that again? So if there are some things that you have to correct yourself, it's going to come out as, as that conflicting moment pops. When the conflicting moment pops, you don't have to debate or argue or war. Just, it's so simple. Just plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, surrender it to him, and move on. But a lot of people get troubled by this, and they let this sit, this conflicting feeling sit for a very long time. When you let that sit for a long time, then uh, see, there's that, so much of that stubbornness, that flesh that's still in there. It's just, it's just good to get it out of the way by pleading the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and walking by faith, let it, leaving it alone in God's hands, just trusting him and moving on with your life. When you live that way, then what happens is, when you live that way, you can have more hope. Right. See? Right. More positive things to glory about. Like, man, God is so good to me. God has provided my needs. Uh, I mean, this trial that I'm going through, God has blessed me more than what I've suffered. See, stuff like that come out of your mind. The hope and positivity still builds up in spite of the hardship and trials that you go through. But this can only come when you have faith. So if you want hope, you need faith. Faith is so important. The only way a martyr endured through the flames for hours, for hours and hours, was only faith. He had to believe he was dying for the right thing. He had to believe that his doctrine was true while the Inquisition was wrong. He had to believe that if I deny Jesus Christ, that's a dishonorable thing that I can do to him. He had to have so much faith in that. He had to believe that this suffering is nothing compared to what Jesus Christ, the glory that shall be revealed. I mean, do you believe that verse when you go to Romans and Corinthians, that I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hebrews 11, they were scourged, afflicted, of whom the world was not worthy. Man, that's, those are strong words from those verses. In other words, whatever you suffer down here, whatever you go through, is not even comparable to all of heaven for eternity, to what God has planned out for you. But think about this. You're missing out God's eternity, what he waited out for you, for a temporary relief. You always have to remember that when you undergo trial and suffering. If you want temporary relief, that's fine with you. But remember this, that's only temporary. And you're missing out eternity. And by the way, don't forget this. Every time you borrow temporary relief, you're building up eternal hurt in this life. Obviously not hellfire, but in this life. You're just building up more time for pain. It's easier to, <laughs> you shorten the pain by going through it, by undergoing it already, by walking by faith. Remember, sin and things in this world is always borrowed time. People think that you can gain happiness and you live in happiness. That's not how it works. It's called economics. You have to give something. You have to give and trade something. That's how life works. When we undergo 
hope. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. We have a thing called the blessed hope that we're looking forward to. The blessed hope delivers us from all our problems, our pain, and our trials. So in Romans chapter 8, the Bible points out in verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But we hope for that we see not. Then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, we have this hope within us when we go to the book of Colossians. Go to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I like this verse. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 27. I mean, Colossians 1, 27. Excuse me. Colossians 1, 27. To whom God would make known what is the what? Riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now compare that with 1 Corinthians 2. 1 Corinthians 3, excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3 is one of the best chapters for our day and age in this church, I believe. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Look at verse 21. Verse 21. There's nothing in this world that you can glory in because remember, like I said, it's borrowed time. You lose it. And then you have to pay for it. But in 1 Corinthians 3, 21, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, notice, all are yours. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Now, why do we have such hope? We have a lot of hope because of Jesus Christ in us. Now, this is something that you have to go by faith, but in here, it's just matter-of-fact statement. It doesn't require your belief. Even if you don't have faith, for example, even if you don't believe that it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Even if you don't live your life by faith, even if you don't believe in that, when you get up there, sorry, it's a matter of fact. It's truth. When you see him, I don't care how bitter, upset, or sad, or miserable, or whatever you are, truth is truth, and then hope will just flood within your heart and soul. You'll forget what you are mad about. Amen. Imagine the judgment seat of Christ. Here you come. You're going to say a thing or two to God and say, why this, why that, and then after you experience heaven, God's going to say, okay, um, oh, what was it you're upset about? And then you go, uh, uh, you forget. Because hope is overwhelming you. So hope is just matter of fact. It's just truth. It's just a promise. Promise is promise, meaning God cannot lie. Meaning he can't take back his word. Meaning that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. So even if you break your promises, your walk with God, God can't break his promise with you. you now, this is the glory that we receive. It's up to you to live in it, to receive it, to claim it. Uh, faith, remember, is that key operation. It's that key operation. It's a hindrance if you don't have faith. But this is just a matter-of-fact truth, so it's up to you if you're going to claim that. A lot of people don't claim it. That's why they feel hurt, depressed, miserable, yearning for something to fill in the void. A lot of people who go by flesh, flesh is just borrowed time. Flesh is sensations that wear out. 
Flesh is something that you have to exercise to gain some feeling quite often. But there's something in there that's missing no matter how much you please your flesh. And everybody tried everything out there in the world. So the reason why is because they don't realize they have a soul. That's why, isn't it amazing, a lot of people have everything in the world, but they still go to psychologists? Why? Because it's the study of the soul. They're trying to find something to fill in that void. Now, within your soul that's trying to fill in that void, you can't go by fleshly things, obviously, because it'll always be empty. So if you go by the spirit, the spiritual thing will feed you. The spiritual thing will give satisfaction to you. What is in you is Jesus Christ. If your soul is bound and connected to the spiritual nature, to Jesus Christ, his body, then you have the glory. If you have the glory, you have his promises. <coughs> the riches, I like how it said that. Romans 11 uh, described it as unsearchable riches. Why? Because I showed you at 1 Corinthians 3, whether Paul, Apollos, uh, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, the world, present, future, all are yours. Why? Because everything belongs to Jesus Christ, God, all of creation, past, present, future, the world, the universe, everything. If everything is him and you have Jesus Christ, then what do you have then? You got eternity at the palm of your hand. The only thing is you got to claim it but you're not claiming it for yourself. You know why you're not claiming it for yourself? You're trying to go by always physical claims, right, right. fleshly claims, what your body feels, thinks, and sees, and stuff like that. No, you're not going to claim anything out of that. Yeah. Well, God's promises aren't real to me because I don't feel it, because I don't see it. I don't see that with my home that's suffering uh, bills to pay, and I'm overworking my body, and then I have to make ends meet, and I'm going through problems in my family, problems in my church, and, oh, health problems, what am I going to do? You keep claiming what your body feels, what your body's undergoing. That's why you have no promise. You have to claim the promise of what God promised you in his word. If that soul is bound to that spiritual nature, and God is a spirit, and you... Have Jesus Christ in you. See, he's in you. Do you understand? The hope of glory. That's what Paul called it at Colossians 1. Yeah. And Christ is everything. <clears throat> when you get into that spiritual plane and your soul sees what Jesus Christ sees, then you realize that you're the most wealthy person in the world. Because as you're sitting down with that uh, empty plate and so many bills to pay, if the soul is blinded to those physical things that your physical sight is seeing, those physical emotions are feeling, and then all that pops out in your mind is, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. See, that riches, glory. Then all you're doing is like what George Mueller did before he prayed over an empty meal is, Thank you, Lord, for providing my need. Okay. And God always answered his prayer and gave him the financial support and the food that he needed. Why? Because he's only looking at the promises. He's only claiming the promises. He's only living by promises. He's not living by starvation. He's not living by what the flesh wants. He's not living by fleshly empty feelings, what his flesh sees. Now, what are you living by, claiming by? Uh, if all you see is this world, then that's all you're going to see. But if all you see is, man, this is in my control, my hands, this, is all, this all belongs to me, even though your flesh don't has it in its hands, but it all belongs to Jesus Christ, right? So you know as long as you follow his will, then according to, accordingly to his will, he'll give you exactly what is right for you and the best of what's for you. And especially when you reign with him for all eternity, this is all yours anyway. You have to think that way. If you claim and live that way, then there's a lot of happiness and joy. 
It does a lot of good to your mental well-being. Faith is necessary to overcome problems, and hope is necessary to maintain your happiness in the Lord. It's who you are, the soul, the real you, the person, who you are. You make up of joy and happiness because uh, out, Jesus Christ, outside of Jesus Christ, there shouldn't be sorrow. There should be joy in him. Uh, there are verses, so many verses. It says rejoice, what? In the Lord. Yeah. So you're not claiming in him. You're not applying him to yourself. You're not happy, then uh, you're not applying Jesus Christ to your life. And quite often, the Lord will he'll make that trial harder or that pain harder so that you can finally draw closer to him because you're just too close to your flesh. And that flesh needs to be broken. Once it's broken, finally you fall into Jesus Christ and then you can claim and apply what he's doing upon your life. Now, are you applying Jesus Christ? And if you're not, then you're not living in joy. You're not living in happiness. Uh, because you're applying your joy to still feelings of the flesh or things in this world. All right? Never, ever do that. Then you'll always be depressed and sad. We come to 1 Corinthians 13. On charity, the Bible says in verse 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but notice the greatest of these is charity. This is very important, faith and hope. Faith is crucial because you don't want to get deceived by wrong doctrines you don't want to get deceived by trials or temptations from the wicked one. Faith is the only thing that keeps you alive, okay? Faith is the only thing that keeps you alive. That's the very first step before charity and hope is faith. So crucial. Faith is the victory. A lot of times, remember, if you're going through problems, you have to ask yourself, am I living by faith? You have to do that. Do I have the truth, right doctrine, the right book, right belief? Do I, uh, that's how Bible believers, we live as Bible believers. Believing the Bible, that's faith, right? So you have to have that first foundation set. Second thing is hope. Hope is where you're applying and claiming Jesus Christ in you and you see the promises of God and you apply and claim those riches from Jesus Christ. Extremely important if you want to live. <laughs> Charity is what will make the difference in your living with others. In your living with others. Faith and hope is for yourself. And then for others around you, it's going to be charity. Because uh, love is something where you can't just love without somebody, right? You cannot do that. It doesn't make sense. So you need somebody else outside of you. That's how love is going to act and perform. So it is the people around you and obviously your God. When love is placed upon others outside of yourself, there's more of a sacrificial act there. Now, faith, you see a lot of suffering, sacrifice, right? But a person can do the heaviest act of sacrifice and lack charity. So he still lacks sacrifice. Uh, what do I mean by that? When we go to 1 Corinthians 13, we know that verse. The Bible points out in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor... And though I give my body to be burned, like the martyr, right? That's huge right there. And have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. It's still going to be nothing because 
This is just self-satisfaction, not thinking about others around you. If you have an act of faith that you believe God is going to provide your need, that God's going to reward you for that, but there is no sacrifice on your part on the good you did for others, then it all counts to nothing. It's just a fantastical faith that you created. That's why charity is the greatest. I can tell you Bible believers full of faith and right doctrine and things that they go through in life, and then they lack so much charity against other people. And that they're living then lives full of nothing. Uh, Jesus Christ said about the church in Ephesus that they were full of faith. They did a lot of works for him. So they went through, a, they had a lot of faith. They were faithful. But Jesus Christ said, nevertheless, I have someone against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Love is very important. Let me tell you one thing about people is that there are people who are faithful, committed to the Lord, follow every instruction. And the Bible says obedience is better than sacrifice. But while they're living their life full of obedience, there is no meaning. So it's an empty obedience. Love is the thing that fills in. Love acts, right? That's why you obey. Is because there's a love in there. So I know that you believe. That's why you're able to do it. But if all you do is just believe and there is no love, then it's meaningless still. It's meaningless still. Because God created you with the purpose of you to love him. The reason why he wants you to obey him is because you love him more than anything else. If you just go by blind obedience, now this is the problem with a lot of um, community cultures. Now, community cultures, like Asian cultures, for example, or at least most, uh, they're very faithful. They're very committed. They're very disciplined people. Uh, they take authority seriously. There is obedience there. That's the problem with our American culture. We've lost that. So what they do is that they always question. They always do what they want. There's rebellion. And you can't trust Americans to take care of something if they're always going to argue and fuss and whine with you. But within a community culture, they're faithful. They will be there. And why is that? Because that's their culture, their mindset. There's obedience there. There's so much faith, see? There's so much trust in authority. So then they do things because it's the right thing to do. It's part of their culture. So that's why they take culture seriously. I, I will dishonor my family if I don't do this. So they, they prioritize what is right, what is honorable. So that's a wonderful thing. But I notice that this is a horrible mess, which is where cult leaders or dictators, especially messed up governments, can easily take advantage of Asian communities. And then they become mindless slaves for them. That's the one good thing about the American culture is that they're independent. So they don't become mindless slaves. Why? Because what they have is they want, they don't want to just mindlessly obey. They want to find meaning to themselves here. So there's something meaningful. That's why they're independent. If they're going to choose a job or they're going to choose a college major that they want, they don't do it because of family honor or, you know, it's the right thing to do. No, it's because I want to. Yeah. There's an independent thinking there. Why am I doing this, see? I'm doing this because this is better for this and this and this. See, there's that independent thinking there. That's what community cultures, Asian cultures lack. That's a horrible mess. And you wonder why they get to see by cults. They're not independently thinking for themselves. They're not questioning. 
Americans, they're all about, you know, finding meaning to themselves. They're all about love and feeling something and stuff like that. They don't want to just do things because it's mindless to do so. They want something to fill in the void that's meaningful. Now, think about this. Throughout your Bible, get this, God is not an American. You notice that? He's very community-based. He expects everyone to obey. When he says so, that's it, no question. He doesn't have to explain things to you like typical Americans. I need to know why. I need to know why. You know, that's the Grecians, right? That's the uh, Japhethites' problem. Is like, why, why? You know, I need to know, stuff like that. Asian is, no, I mean, just tell me, I believe you, and I'll do it. That's God's mentality. But notice that it turned into this legalism law thing where everybody always just messed up then. If you have a king that died, the nation of Israel fell. Why? They're used to an authoritative figure. They're not used to obeying out of their own will, free will. When you get to the church age, okay, there's liberty. Now, uh, y'all love me out of your free will, then they're just abusing it like there's no tomorrow. Do you see the problem here? The problem is, is that these three need to act together. So then there's that obedience from faith, but then there's that love where I'm doing this not because God told me to do it, because I love him. Do you understand? There's got to be those things mixed in together. If God tells you, that's it, obey, no questions whatsoever. Why do you mourn? Why do you whine about it? But at the same time, when you decide on that decision to do what God tells you to do, you're not doing it because you're forced to. You're doing it because I want to. Because I love him. If you get these th two gaps that bridges together, it'll become the most powerful thing ever. And this returns to what I mentioned before about more sacrifice comparing to faith as a sacrifice. Because you can have faith and go through martyrdom and suffering but if you don't do that for others, if you don't do that for the Lord, then it's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. You have to have others in mind. Great, you read the Bible and you pray. Who are you doing it for? For yourself? People do that. Then all the devil has to do is attack you. Where you yourself will feel contradictory to Bible reading and prayer. You can't do it for yourself. you got to think about, who am I doing this for? Every time people go to work, every time people raise their kids, they're always thinking about not themselves. They're thinking about their family, their children, their home. They do that. Uh, because why? That's a part of their love. Do you have someone that you love? And then if you do, then you tend to do things for them that you never do for yourself. If you don't have love, then that shows why there's bitterness. That shows why there is jealousy. That shows also why you cannot get along. It shows why you're always self-pitying yourself. You know why? You love yourself too much, not others. You have to think about others there. And then what happens is there's an understanding of people in spite of them doing wrong to you. What happens is then you tend to do more things than they do for you. What happens is even if they never get it right with you, you make it right with them. So you get yourself right. That's something right there. That's something big. Uh, you know why you can't do that? You just love yourself too much. Making yourself look right. Making yourself look like the good guy. Uh, having people do things for you. See that? You, you see that twisted love? That's a twisted love. A lot of people are living by twisted love now. What they want is not to love others, but others to love them. That's why there's fornication going around. That's why there's divorces rampant. 
That's why there's this socialization where people want to develop a lot of friends or business partners and all that is because not because they love others, it's because they love themselves. They want fame, they want popularity, they want something to gratify their flesh, they want people to think good about them. That's a problem now. That's a huge problem. You have to think about what can I do for others, and that's sacrificial love. When you think about others, then you think about God too. Uh, excuse me, there we go. If you look at 1 John, it mentions that uh, God is love, and because God is love, we love the brethren. And when we love the brethren, it doesn't go contradictory to the love of God because the brethren are, are the body of Jesus Christ, right? So if you claim you love Jesus Christ, how can you love Jesus Christ if you hate his body? Okay. Doesn't make sense. That's contradictory. Right. They make up him. So what you do is that you have to love Jesus Christ in them and not them. Okay. When you do that, then it filters out all the other stuff. Um, it makes me wonder if you're still bitter or covetous or you don't really love them as much. It's because you keep looking at them, not Jesus Christ in them. So when you keep looking at them, then you're thinking that uh, then your love's in the wrong place. You're loving them. <laughs> you got to love Jesus Christ in them. That's good, uh, we love him because he first loved us. Uh, if Jesus Christ is the one who took you out of a mess and saved you from a lot of problems, uh, he did the same thing with that other brother and sister in Christ too. Yes. And the other person is not less lovable than you. Right. All right? It took as much effort for Jesus Christ to love that person as much as he did with you. Amen, so we all share inside this love of Jesus Christ and see Jesus Christ in them. And when you do more of that, then you can be more understanding about what they're going through. And also you can forgive things that's hard for you to forgive or to overlook things that's hard to overlook. And um, it's easier to see the good or how the Lord's using them in their lives to help you. If you think that justice or revenge or uh, punishment from God has to be uh, placed upon that person to satisfy you know, how you feel toward them, then the problem right here is when you keep seeing it that way, then you're, not, then you're questioning how God's dealing with their lives. Perhaps the Lord's not doing that with them because the Lord knows there's something good about them that he's using for his glory, so that's why he tends to be merciful, because he's doing that with you. The reason why God is merciful to you is because there's something good about you that pleases him. So that's why he lets you get away with some things. He puts up with you. You ever seen that with kids? Is that sometimes they just drive you insane and it just makes you upset. But they do, there's... They've done a lot of good or they've done something good, so that's, what, that's why you tolerate with them more. Same thing with people in church. Okay. So it happens that way. Uh, if that's what Jesus Christ sees, there's something good about them, then uh, you have to think about something, then you have to see what Jesus Christ is seeing. What, what good thing are they doing? A lot of people who get bitter, fight, and mad, they always see the bad. They don't see the good. If they see the good, then they start to become more understanding. And the evidence is within marriage disputes. Within marriage disputes, they always try to see something bad or wrong about the person. They don't see something good about the person. If they see something good, it makes them more understanding of their personal deficits. Sometimes a lot of their personal deficits, their flaws, is because of the good personality traits that they have. Now, I know that's hard to believe, but for example, I'm a very uh, critical person, and that can be a bad thing. But no, it's because of my personality of being critical, I find the truth. I become more confident in my faith. I can make things where I can give the best to people. If a person understands that about my personality, then they can be understanding when I'm critical of them, so to speak, right? 
It's the same thing when you do that with other people about their personalities. You might see it as, oh, that person's just so emotional. No, maybe the person loves Jesus Christ more than you. All right? And they love other people, and they love you more than you love them. So then, that's why sometimes their deficits of being very emotional can come out as a turnoff to you or even a burden. But sometimes you have to see the good that the Lord's using them for out of those deficits. Okay? All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, uh, I pray today's teachings have been helpful. It has ministered spiritually helped them. I've only done what I could, Lord. Uh, I don't know anything, Lord, and I don't know any better, but only you, and thank you for helping me through this. And I pray that they'll be able to apply it into their lives and use it for your glory. I pray that it's all been pleasing and truthful to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.